Okay, so I'm here today with Martin Isles from the uh, ACL, the Australian Christian Lobby, and he's also the presenter of the new cast, The Truth of It. So good morning to you, Martin. Thank you so much for joining us here at Compelling Reason. Good evening, Paul. Oh, good evening. Yes, it's, it's good. Night time. Yes, it's <laughs> it's nice very, very early here, though. <laughs> okay, so Martin, could you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and the ACL? Sure. So the ACL uh, stands for Australian Christian Lobby. Um, the whole purpose of the ACL is in its motto, which is truth made public. Uh, it started in 1996 as an exclusively political lobbying organisation to have somebody who was able to uh, bring the Christian perspective to parliamentarians right around the country mm -hmm. uh, and to have a significant following of people who would back them from churches, all denominations. Um, it has grown and grown and grown and grown ever since. Uh, these days, it would be um, easily one of the largest Christian organisations in Australia. It's one of the largest political movements in Australia of any stripe um, and uh, we have uh, yeah many supporters and we not only go and see politicians as lobbyists but we do an awful lot of grassroots activity lots of uh, stuff out in the field with our many volunteers and they're wonderful people uh, but also we do a lot of work in the media uh, and we do quite a bit of work in alternative media as well as you just mentioned the truth of it yeah. uh, which has been responsible for a lot of growth lately so we really try to articulate truth in the public squares that's wonderful and could you tell us a little bit about yourself Kind of your upbringing, your Christian background? Yeah, sure. So uh, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer by background. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a Christian upbringing, uh, big family. I came from the Australian city of Brisbane, which is uh, okay. in Queensland, known as the Sunshine State, the subtropical state. Uh, where maybe a lot of people from the UK, actually a lot of expats from the UK live in Brisbane. I can okay. tell you that for sure, especially by the sea uh, in, the, in, in the Moreton Bay District and the Redlands District. And I grew up in that area, beautiful uh, part of the world near the Gold Coast as well. And uh, yeah, wonderful Christian family, uh, very, very involved in church. Went to a church that was relatively small, very ministry and outreach minded. So I was doing a lot of that kind of stuff from a very early age, reading the Bible, preaching, teaching, do, running a youth group and doing youth ministry. But yes, when I started a small business, then became a lawyer, and then, you know, through a whole bunch of, um, well, providential circumstances, found myself at the Australian Christian Lobby uh, and ultimately the managing director, which is my current role. Wow. Okay. So why is the ACL so needed and important today? Well, I think the, the thing we're seeing at the moment is that the public squares really are a key battleground for truth. Yeah. Um, what happens in the public squares shapes society, it shapes people, and it shapes a nation and the direction a nation is taking. Mm. And we are seeing um, right across the Western world, the public squares being dominated and shaped by many forces, many ideologies, uh, many of them opposed to Christianity, anti-God, and you see the hostility against Christianity and the apathy to Christianity that's rising in the nations around the Western world um, as, as proof of that. Um, and I guess it struck me early on when I first got the managing director job, I was reading in Isaiah 59 mm -hmm. and I realized that God is actually very concerned about the public squares. Mm. Um, he laments there through the mouth of Isaiah that truth has stumbled in the public squares. Yeah. Uh, and he says, because truth has stumbled, there's no righteousness because you don't have the truth about right and wrong and morality. And if there's no righteousness, there's no justice. Yeah. And that means that people suffer. And he looks and he marvels and it displeases him that there's nobody to intercede for the cause of truth in the public squares. And mm. that really hit home. Uh, I also think of Romans 13, where those with governing authority are called ministers of God and servants of God. This does concern God. Um, and those public squares are very powerful places for Christians yeah. to fulfill our mandate to be salt and light in the world, to shine the light of truth, uh, to stand firm and uncompromised as the salt that stops society decaying and falling apart, uh, and also a strong and a powerful place for us to proclaim the gospel as well when we get those opportunities, as mm. we do. Um, and I think, therefore, to be a specialist in that area uh, is so important um, and it's a place where many Christians and churches are shut out. Yeah. Uh, and so we're very blessed in Australia to have been able to have that voice and do the things that we've been doing. And um, look, it's attracting uh, not just, uh, not just uh, you know, older Christians, but many younger Christians as well who are looking for a voice of clarity uh, in the public squares. That's fantastic. Yeah, and as you said, you, you really do have a very strong voice now. You're, we're hearing about you in the UK, and I've been watching your, you call it a newscast, the truth of it? 
Absolutely, we can lo- call it that. Yes, <laughs> absolutely love that show. It's fantastic. I really, really enjoy yeah. that, and uh, some of the the topics and issues that you deal with just absolutely spot on from a Christian perspective. Now, I'm going to ask you um, what some would consider a very difficult question, and that is, could you define truth for us? Yes, I I think I can, um, because it, at a basic level, God is truth. Yeah. Um, and by extension, then, everything that comes from God is truth. Hmm. Um, that tells us a lot of things about truth, actually. That tells us, for example, something very countercultural, that truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Truth is unchanging. Truth is fixed. It's objective. And it can be discovered, therefore. Um, also, um, every good thing comes from truth because God is goodness. Um, and I think that's something we've lost uh, in our culture at the moment, that truth is good uh, and that all good things are found really in the truth, including compassion, yeah. uh, including peace, including justice, freedom even, uh, righteousness, all those things are found in our discovery of and our adherence to truth hmm. uh, because all of those things characterize God. Uh, and God's the author of truth. All things that come from God, including creation itself, uh, is, is truth. Um, and that means there's great hope for us all because truth is discoverable um, and uh, we can order our lives by it um, and, and enjoy the blessing of that. So uh, I think you're right. It's a very abstract question, but it's mm. actually very practical when you start to think about it. And it really is. And, and obviously, the further we move away from truth, the further we move away from God as well in society also. Um, another question I want to ask that kind of leads on from that is how important is truth, reason, logic in the in the public arena for a Christian uh, or the Christian faith, the gospel message. Um, so how important would you say that is for us today? I think it's, well, first of all, if we're to be good ambassadors for Christ, uh, if we're to be good witnesses um, for the God of the universe and, mm. and the gospel in the world, um, of course, uh, we, have to be, we have to uphold truth mm. uh, because Jesus called himself the truth. He said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He certainly did. Um, and also the whole world is rationally intelligible. It makes sense because it's made by a rational God uh, who is the author of truth. Uh, and so I think that if we're to have a good testimony, we must always adhere to what is true hmm. and we must stand in truth. We must speak truth and we must have lives that are ordered as nearly as possible as we, po- as we can. And as frail and fallen humans, it's, we're, never, we're never right on the money, but we can, we, can, we can work very hard at living out the truth. So there's that aspect of it, which is that I think it's essential from that point of view. I also think it's essential because I believe, and I've, I've seen this more and more, um, truth does resonate um, hmm. with human beings. Uh, And, you know, you can think of something like the conscience and and scripture tells us that people have a conscience. Um, And it's like there's a there's an inbuilt voice of God, a moral compass in everybody's mind that will accuse them and that will uh, that will that will bind them uh, when they do wrong. And it's true that you can see your conscience. You can bury it under all sorts of things. You can uh, you can you can you can twist your conscience and you can reshape it and retrain it. But it's always there. Mm. Um, and I think that the more people double down on their conscience and try to hide it, the more they struggle with themselves in key ways. It never really goes away. It's that persistent voice. Um, I think it's the same with truth. I think people can train themselves in all kinds of ways. Mm. Uh, I think people can believe all sorts of lies. Uh, I think that people can, you know, get very far away from truth. And yet, and yet, when they really hear truth from the God of the universe, uh, and they hear truth about the world, it still resonates. Mm. What they do about that is up to them, but it resonates. And so I think that the declaration of that truth is so crucial. That's why God, I think, is so concerned about truth in the public squares and truth that people can see and hear. And, uh, you know, you think of um, the Apostle Paul says, God desires all people everywhere to come to a knowledge of the truth. Absolutely. Um, because it is yeah. it is so important. Um, so uh, I think that uh, truth is essential to be effective, Yep. I think truth is essential to be a good witness, um, but it's not quite the whole story. Um, well, it is actually, but but you'll see what I mean in just a second. Um, you, I think that people are affected not just by truth in the sense of logical arguments. Yes. They definitely are, and that's crucial. But people are affected by truth in the life, mm. and so much of our effectiveness in in, in apologetics, in in, in reason, in public reason, and in reaching others with our faith. A lot of it comes out of, yes, logic and, and, and argument and debate, of course, 
but a lot of it comes out of the testimony of our lives. And I have found time and again, it's who you are and it's, uh, it's your friendships and it's the way people interact with you and what they perceive of you when they meet you that is so powerful. I mean, here in this country, people who meet me often think, well, this guy's probably going to be a, a very nasty piece of work because that's just the, the rhetoric that's out there. Uh, but, you know, you could, it can be a tremendously powerful thing when people meet you and they go, goodness gracious, he's not like that at all. Um, and I think that we should always aim to be that person who people, they sense something, something different. Um, I'm named after a guy called Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yep, and he says people, well. should, people yeah. should, people should, that's right, from, from the UK, of course, um, and uh, a wonderful, wonderful preacher uh, of, of the 20th century. Uh, and one of the things he always says that I listened to when I was quite young was when people meet you, they should sense relatively quickly that there's something quite different about you. Uh, and he says it should be whether they know it or not that you're a Christian. Uh, and so I think that, of course, is not divorced from truth. That's the truth in the life. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's both of those things that I see as being very powerful in this day and age. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, uh, so I, you're a very eloquent man. You're a very good speaker. I've seen you on several um, news programs where they've tried to kind of trap you and, and corner you with certain questions. And uh, you manage each time to, to kind of wiggle your way out of there. But you're you know, very eloquent, very, very good. Uh, could you explain to our viewers today that the process that you go through in preparing um, for your talks, for the truth of it, and even for kind of news, news programs as well? Yeah, wow, that's a good question. It's by the grace of God, Paul. I tell you what, every time I go on one of these things, I think this is probably going to be it. It's curtains today. You know, they're going to they're gonna manage to contort my thinking into such a in such a manner that some words will pop out of my mouth that's, that sound terrible, and that'll be the end. But it never is. You know, God's good, and um, yeah, He does give you the words to speak. Uh, he does say that He'll give you the words to speak, actually, yes. in Scripture. Um, but uh, it depends on the setting. So. Uh, maybe firstly, if I'm going into a hostile environment, uh, and particularly in 2019, I, I did a, an awful lot of that, mm. uh, going onto television networks and really being, you know, hit hard uh, and having to give an answer, an apologia, a defense <laughs> for, for what I'm saying and for the truth. Um, in those environments, um, there's two, th two P's, I say, preparation and prayer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, preparation is just crucial. You, you have to spend quite a bit of time really thinking through the, the, the possibilities. Uh, I walk around my hotel rooms shouting out um, answers to fictitious questions uh, and just get the, the, the synapses in the brain firing off okay. uh, and, 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 and going through worst case scenarios. You know, what if they hit me with this outrageously horrendous question or, or tried to throw me off with this? And you just anticipate it and answer. And then when you go and sit down, you're so in the zone from all of that that it, it flows quite naturally. Hmm. That's one side, and the preparation makes a huge difference. But the other side is I, I pray very deliberately uh, before anything that I do in that regard. And I particularly pray. I remember what the, first, the first big one that I did, uh, and it was on probably Australia's most hostile television program. Okay. <laughs> it was on uh, something called The Sunday Project on Sunday nights. Uh, and there's certainly no friends of us. And it was the Israel Folau case, so it was... Okay. Um, uh, for those who remember that. And, and I was going on, there was the first really big one I'd done, or maybe the second, but anyway. Uh, and I prayed then that um, I might get an opportunity um, to uh, even explain the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing to see your prayers answered because right at the end of that interview, the fellow sort of leans in and he says to me, he says, oh, he goes, just before you go, and you know, every time they say, just before you go, they're about to drop something. <laughs> and he said, just before you go, he said, do you think that homosexuals go to hell? <laughs> uh, and... I was able then to say, well, actually, I think that apart from Jesus Christ, you know, we're all destined to be judged by God yeah. and we will all be found wanting if we go and stand before God in our own strength and there will be judgment. Uh, and then I was able to say, but of course, the grace of God is that he's come to meet us in the provision of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice yeah. on the cross and the cross of Christ <laughs> is the only answer. Uh, and I was able to say that. And then he leans in again and he says, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your answer. He says, could you tell me, please? And so I, I just said, well, OK. And I answered it all over again. And I was able to get that in twice. Amazing. And it all went yeah. to air uh, on a primetime Sunday night television program, which is uh, a, the, the biggest night of the week for TV in Australia. Um, and those sorts of things are really, really brilliant. And I think God orchestrates those. So preparation and prayer for the hostile stuff. Um, but you did mention the truth of it as well, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's not as organized as people think. <laughs> I, I go through a week, which is, tends to be pretty manic, and, and I'll see a story or a thing, and I go, ah, oh, 
I could talk about that. And I just know in my own mind if it's something that I have something to say about. And so I might refer it to, I've got a wonderful researcher who um, will give me a little brief on it. And she knows the sorts of things that I'm looking for. And I will sit down the day before or on the day and I'll just go through it, read it all up. And then I'll think to myself, well, what is it that I could say here? And my overarching purpose is that I want to show the people who view the truth of it um, that our faith, the things we believe, comprehend entirely and explain the very world in which we're living now. Yeah. And I really want to draw people back from what is happening culturally, what is happening in the news, what we're seeing unfold around us. And I want to draw them back in to say, and you know what, the things we believe are the foundation stones to explain that. And I usually find myself in scripture by the end of it. And that's really my point. And, and, and with that overarching uh, mission in my mind, I, I sit down and, and write those things and then we shoot an episode. Okay, great, fantastic. It was actually that news broadcast that I had in mind when I asked that question, uh, because that was, oh. uh, yeah, that was one of the broadcasts that really gave me a lot of respect for you, because there's a lot of Christians kind of in media, but how often do they actually share the gospel? And actually watching you do that, not just once, but twice, I thought, fair play. <laughs> this, <laughs> this guy loves Jesus, so it's fantastic. So, um, well, also I thought, what would the Apostle Paul do? Exactly. <laughs> and I thought to myself, he'd exactly. give us the means. He wouldn't hold back. <laughs> uh, and so I, I had that in my head as well. But yeah, again, that was that was put there by the Lord. And um, amazing, yeah, it, was, uh, it, was, it worked out really well. How many viewers did that go out to? How many? Probably several million, right? Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, it's, uh, I'm not sure what the Sunday Project rates at, but um, it would be, yeah, it, it could be seven figures. Yeah. I Correct. don't, I, I mean, it's a, it's a major rating TV news program on a Sunday night. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, bearing in mind, Australia's population is quite small. We're, we're 25 million. So, okay. uh, you know, whoever's watching telly on the night. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, I saw it in the UK, so that's great. Okay. So you mentioned apologetics earlier. How important is apologetics in your line of work? And a kind of follow up question to that really is do you have a favorite apologetics argument you can share with us um yeah okay i mean look there's two things so um firstly i think apologetics we mentioned i mentioned just before i mean as we know it means apologia or giving yep. a defense uh and so immediately i think people can see the absolute relevance of that to uh, what i do and what the australian christian lobby does which is that in the public squares of our culture um, you know, our Christian beliefs are challenged on every front. Uh, and as a Christian going into that environment, you are on the back foot. You're being pressured. You're being pushed back on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I notice when I go into these interviews is that they just want you to concede. Uh, they just want you to concede something, you know, that you that you really are a bigot or something like this. And, <laughs> True, and, and, yeah. and, and they're just pushing you and they make accusations. Uh, and you can see them sitting there saying, you know, come on, tell us what you really think. We know it's terrible. Uh, and, and there's almost an accusatory. You feel like you're being accused yeah. constantly and you're being pushed and you're being uh, demanded to give an answer. Uh, and it's quite unpleasant because you're not actually hiding anything at all. Um, and I will answer any question that they put to me. Um, but, you know, you're in that position. And so immediately you have to give a defense. Um, and uh, to do that with wisdom and to do it with clarity is a, is a big task. Um, but I do find that a bold defense is essential because um, there is something in that which says that I have confidence in what I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I have absolute certainty uh, in the God of the universe and in, and in Christ and in his word. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a very powerful thing. And I see time and again, uh, Christians who do you know, apologize for mm -hmm. their public statements, um, they're not respected. Yeah. But Christians who go and give a defense yeah. uh, for their public statements, um, actually, that can have a very powerful impact. And I mentioned the Israel Folau case. And there is a yeah. guy who took a bold stand uh, <clears throat> and he said, uh, you know, no, I won't recant. Uh, I can't do that uh, because this is truth and I believe it. Um, and of course, what happened as a result of that was that the whole nation was inspired. I mean, I, mm. I would be out walking in the street and people would just be stopping you left, right and center. Uh, I'd go out walking somewhere with Israel himself and people, you couldn't walk 10 steps without people coming up and saying, you know, well done, thank you. Uh, and all sorts of stories about people coming back to their faith and people uh, being inspired to return to church and all this kind of stuff just came out of that experience. And, yeah. and I saw that that public defense with wisdom, with clarity uh, and with winsomeness as well. Mm. Even though what you believe are firm truths, you can actually defend them in a very winsome way uh, and in a way that shows that your heart is for people. Hmm. Um, and I think that's crucial because that was Jesus's way. He always yeah. had a heart for people, yeah. sometimes through hard and firm truths, but nonetheless, ultimately a heart for people. Yeah. Uh, and that motive uh, always came through. So uh, I think apologetics is crucial uh, to what we do. Um, 
the second. Oh, you asked as well. Um, uh, favorite apologetic argument, mm. I think. So, yeah, um, I think um, I actually like the apologetic argument that the um, that the Apostle Paul uses, um, which is effectively um, that. Uh, he just basically says it's obvious. <laughs> he starts in he starts in Romans chapter Romans one. one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he just says, you know, God's existence. It's not like there's an evidence problem for God's existence. No, it's axiomatic. Um, right? Yeah, yeah. He says actually the, the the problem is a spiritual problem with with people. Uh, the problem is that people won't accept it. That people don't want to accept it. They'd rather suppress that truth uh, in unrighteousness by the pattern of their lives, which denies it. Um, and that's a that's a powerful thing to to claim. But of course, when he gives his reasons, you are left going, well, it is obvious, isn't it? Because he says, well, how obvious? Well, it's as obvious as the fact that you know the buildings we're sitting in aren't the product of an explosion in a hardware store. Um, you know, that's just not how these things come about. Um, they're the product of, of, of great intellect, of, of organized uh, and, um, and, and clear thinking individuals who have got tertiary education and are relying on years and years and years of the development of engineering principles and standards and construction. Hmm. Uh, it's actually quite a miracle that these buildings are here and they work the way that they do. Um, and it, you know, he says, you know, how much more, of course, are the fingerprints of God on creation, uh, which an infinity of human minds will never plumb the depths of? Um, and he just makes that simple point and lets it sit. And I guess that was a revelation for me. I realized why the Bible never goes to great lengths to prove God's existence. It just opens with those words, in the beginning, God created. Mm -hmm. And basically it's saying, all right, this much you know, this much you know by nature, this much is revealed to you and is self-evident in the world in which you're living. There's creation, there's God, there's a beginning. And the Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says he, his eternity, his power, his divine nature, all clearly seen ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that nobody has an excuse. Mm. Uh, and that's how Scripture begins. Uh, and uh, I just find myself sitting there thinking, you know what, we should rest on that and know. I mean, the psalmist actually says, you know, it says that uh, the heavens declare the glory of God yeah. and the creation, you know, his handiwork. Uh, and it says night after, it says night after night, they pour forth speech. Uh, it says there is no speech, but they pour forth speech. There's this weird contradiction there where they're not talking, but they are. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at them, God means you to hear from him hmm. about who he is and the fact that he is there. And I think that every Christian knows the sense of that yeah. uh, when you are in spectacular nature, hmm. uh, when you are in the beauty of the world and you're looking at it. And I, I live in, a, uh, uh, in Canberra, which is called the bush capital in Australia. Okay. It's a very beautiful setting. Uh, you can go up on any nature reserve, on mountains, on hilltops, and you can look out over the lake and you can look out over, over, over rolling hills and mountains of nature, and it's beautiful. And I just think to myself, the heavens declare, you know, yes, <laughs> the creation yeah. speaks. Um, and I love that argument because it, it does bring it back to something very simple that I think we should persevere with, which is showing people that it is obvious and so much of the explanatory frameworks they come up with to explain away creation and the universe are just that. They're fig leaves. Mm. Um, you know, they say, oh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's slow. Uh, it's an evolutionary ordering of things. Mm. And you go, well, that's not how things trend. We know about entropy. We know about um, the laws of thermodynamics. We know how the world works. It trends to chaos. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that um, actually... Uh, the evolutionary process itself doesn't create new genetic information. It selects traits out of species. You know, it makes them simpler, not more complex. Yeah. You know, there's something else missing from this picture. It's the intellect. It's the input. It's the creation. It's the creator. Um, and I think we should persevere with that because I think it's true that, uh, as Paul says, it's quite clear. Yeah, and that's what led me to Christ at the age of 16. Because I was raised in, a, I'd say, a home that was atheist or agnostic. They didn't really, we didn't ever really talk about God in the home. But it was one evening when I was playing football on the field. I looked up at the heavens, looked up at the stars, and it just dawned on me. Um, we've got kind of one of two options here. Either nothing created everything, which is a logical impossibility, or there's an eternal or everlasting something that created the universe. Right. You've got one of two options. And for me, um, that's a bit of a no-brainer. That kind of led me to a faith in God. And then when I heard the gospel later on of Jesus Christ, the, the conviction of the Spirit upon my conscience, which you mentioned earlier too, that's kind of what led me to repentance and a saving faith in Jesus. So thank you so much for sharing that, because for me, that's just mm. absolutely spot on. Um, mm. So we asked the question then, uh, who is God? Who is Jesus Christ? The big questions. 
Those are big questions, Paul. <laughs> that might even be bigger than what is truth. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, um, well, as I just said, I mean, Scripture begins with those words, in the beginning, God created. And so the first thing we learn about God is that he's the all-powerful creator of the universe. Uh, he's the one, uh, as Paul says, in whom we live and move and have our being. Mm. Uh, the supreme, eternal, all-powerful Lord by whom all things exist, by whom we have been created. Uh, that's who he is, first of all. Uh, but of course, um, I guess as human beings, as, as personal people, as relational people, we then can ask the question, yeah, but who is he? You know, who is he? What's he like? Uh, you know, how do you know him? Um, uh, what is, you know, what is his nature? Mm. Uh, and, and all those questions come up. And yeah, they're revealed in scripture and they're revealed to some degree in creation. You know, we mentioned that he's a, he's a, he's a logical, intelligible God that made a logical, intelligible world, you know. And, and the scriptures speak in terms of his glory being revealed through these mediums, which just is, you know, the, the, the substance of who he is is coming, shining through. Hmm. Um, but of course, the Bible shows us something, which is when we ask that question, really, uh, who is he? Yeah. Um, then actually, that's where Jesus comes in. Uh, and uh, and it is true that God has sent the Lord Jesus Christ to make himself known, yeah. uh, to reveal who he really is. Um, and of course, that's the whole problem of the human race is that we ask, who is he? Mm. We're not naturally in relationship to him. Uh, but of course, in his grace, he sent the Lord Jesus to come and restore that relationship and make himself known. Uh, and I have a you know favorite passage of scripture, which is John's Gospel, chapter one. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, no one has seen God at any time, um, but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, or well, the word there is exegeted him, he has explained him, he has unfolded him. Um, and, and then John says, you know, we've seen his glory, you know, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, we saw who he was and he was from God, he revealed God. Yeah. Um, and I love that idea that, um, uh, you know, not only is he, you know, the revelation of the substance of who God is, the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, but actually, he comes from the very heart of God. Mm. You know, the only son who's in the, the bosom, the heart of the father. You know, he's almost like God has sent from his heart uh, his son. Yeah. Um, and you see then in Jesus who God really is. Uh, and you see the astonishing thing that he did to yeah. you know, empty himself, to take on the form of a servant, mm. to live blamelessly because we couldn't, uh, to die uh, for others because we couldn't die for ourselves, mm. um, to you know, do that costly thing, to win, win back people for God and to show us who he was yeah. uh, in his love uh, through, through, through the Son of God, Jesus Sorry. Christ. So I, I, I think that to explain who God is, you must explain who Jesus is uh, because he's the one who's made him known. Fantastic. Um, just as we're closing, now we've got a couple of minutes left. Please, could you define um, what you've, you've, you've just mentioned the, the gospel? Could you define what the gospel message is for any hearers today who perhaps don't know God or they don't know Jesus Christ for themselves? What would they have to do in order to have their sin forgiven and to have a right or living relationship with God today? Yeah, well, I mean, um, well, first of all, as I was kind of hinting at uh, the gospel, what is it really? It's actually God's merciful action towards us as people to restore us to relationship with him. That's what's wrong with the human race. <laughs> We're not in relationship to God. Uh, and to restore us to that, to be able to enjoy him and all that's in him and all his fullness forever. Mm. Uh, that's what the gospel is about. That's what the, the goal is. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the way that we see that play out is that God acts towards us uh, to make that way of restoration, reconciliation in Jesus Christ. Um, and, you know, Jesus, he came into the world to live as a man on behalf of men, a perfect life mm. that we couldn't live and please God. And then he died as a man on behalf of other men and women, uh, which we could never afford to do. If we died, we'd die for our own sins and we would be judged, as I was sort of saying at the start of the interview. Uh, but, you know, God, Christ died for others, uh, the ungodly, unlike himself. And so we have him as well in death. But then, of course, he rose again and he lives a new life. Uh, that we can share in, uh, and he also uh, has the right to be uh, in the throne room of heaven itself, and he can take us there. Uh, and so basically the gospel is this, it is that actually God has moved in Jesus Christ to restore us to relation to, to himself, and it's this, it's this simple that we put our total faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. because he's the one who has done everything that we need, and he's done it on our behalf, yeah. and he's the only confidence that we can have in this world. Uh, and so we place our faith in him, we repent towards God of our sinfulness and who we once were, and that's the gospel. Salvation comes to all of those people, and uh, God moves towards us in that powerful way. And uh, it's, uh, 
the most wonderful thing in the world without the gospel, without the Lord Jesus, without God's moving in him. I'd be nothing. Um, I wouldn't wouldn't yeah. be anything. And I think that every Christian would say the same. Hmm. That's really, really good. And uh, such an important message for everybody to hear today as well. Now, um, one final question, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Fine. You are a great example, obviously, to other Christians. You're an inspiration to myself as well. Where do you get your boldness from? And could you maybe explain to our viewers how you can get bold for Christ in the Christian faith? Oh, that's a good question. Um <laughs> I think two things. Um, actually, um, first and foremost, I would say prayer. Um, you know, um, I've never thought of myself as being particularly bold, um, but uh, following certain key events last year, many people have come to me and said, how are you so bold? How are you courageous? <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, that's interesting. I never thought of myself that way. But I do know this. I do know that I uh, I, I, I did go through a period of time where I prayed for boldness mm. uh, and I prayed for courage. Mm. And you've got to be very careful what you pray for <laughs> because um, sometimes God will answer the prayer. <laughs> yes. And just because somebody looks to be courageous, it doesn't mean that they're not afraid. It doesn't mean that they're not um, nervous. It doesn't mean that they don't face uh, all of those uh, challenges that we face as humans in those, in those moments. Uh, it just means they're given the grace and the strength to overcome it and to 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 walk through it and to handle it well. Uh, and I, I think, firstly, there was that that prayer for boldness. Secondly, I think um, it's a question of conviction. Mm. Um, and conviction is something that begins as a seed and it grows in a person. Uh, and I look at most of my heroes of the faith. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was watching a video of Billy Graham the other day, mm -hmm. or I mentioned Martin Lloyd-Jones, who I'm named after. And you look at these guys, and if you could just pick a word when they when you watch them doing what they do, you think that's conviction. Yeah. You know, this person is 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 you know, it's right through to the core of their being. You know, God has got a hold. They haven't got a hold of God. They haven't got a hold of the Word of God. It's got a hold of them. Yeah. Uh, and, and they are totally uh, believing in this and submitting to it, and God uses them in powerful ways. Yeah. And I think for people who say, well, how do I get conviction? Well, it's a question I ask as well. Uh, and for me, it, it really is a question of getting into the Word of God. It's that simple. Reading it, learning it, mm -hmm. letting the Spirit of God speak to you through it, mm -hmm. um, and, and then just applying it and mm -hmm. seeing its truth. Mm -hmm. um, and simply by doing that and doing that as a habit of life, I really believe that that conviction grows in you uh, and it can't be stopped. Uh, and it's a work of God in the life. But it's so important that you read it, believe it and apply it mm. and you see the truth of it. Yeah. Um, that's the name of my program, the truth of it. The and truth you of see it, the absolutely. truth of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that grows that conviction. So I think yeah. somebody needs that conviction. Uh, and sometimes others can help you get it. You can watch other examples, but also other people can help you to understand the truth of God as revealed in his word. Mm. Um, and that's really important to, to follow along people who can teach well. Mm. Um, and, uh, and the other one is, yeah, pray and, and God will give you opportunities you, you, you didn't believe uh, you'd, you'd survive <laughs> and you, you just might survive. Um, <laughs> oh, I would say this as well. Actually, there's another, this, I've just thought of this. Um, uh, I think the other side of this is um, there's a practical element, very practical element, which is get started. Um, I think people need to just do it. So we all know that in life we have um, moments where we know we could have spoken. We know we could have said something. Uh, we, know, we know those times, those days, right? And we go away and sometimes we didn't say anything. Well, here's my challenge is next time say something. Next time speak. Mm. Actually open your mouth. And you know what? Your voice might shake. Uh, and you know what? You might say what you have to say. It might be quite inarticulate. And you might find that everybody who's standing around you will turn around and tell you you're such a fool and they'll rebuff you and they'll reject you and, they'll, and you'll sit there and go, oh, my gosh, I did a terrible job. Uh, that was so stupid. Uh, but that's OK, because you know what? You'll walk away from that encounter and you'll think about it. Don't overthink it, but you'll think about it and you'll think about how you could have said it better. And you'll think about the arguments they put back to you and you think about how to answer those and then go and do it again. And I tell you, you'll be better than you were last time. Yeah. And by simply being that person who's got the courage and pray for the courage to do it and the opportunity to do it, you know, in five years time, you won't know who you are. Uh, you will really grow in your ability to articulate and speak and mount a bold defense, an mm. apologia for, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, 
And so hopefully in that little milieu of things, uh, there is a milieu, I think is the way you say it, um, of things, um, there is uh, some, some hints for some people as to where to get started. That's great. And obviously we have a scripture for that in, in Acts chapter 4 where the apostles and disciples prayed for boldness and they were filled with the Holy yes. Spirit and, and with boldness and they went out and spoke the word of God. Also, um, in the UK I live in a county called Gloucestershire and I don't know if you've heard of George Whitfield. William yeah. Tyndale, Robert Rakes, yeah. well, all from Gloucestershire. So I'm surrounded by a history of men of God who were just outstanding. And uh, mm. so that's really inspired me. So to get into like the, the literature, the writings of these men of God, uh, mm. just to inspire you to kind of, you know, we, we do obviously we follow Christ's example, uh, but it's also good to follow other men of God who have really kind of impacted society and, and changed things for Almighty God in the past as well. But thank you so much, Martin, for your time today. I really do appreciate you coming on here and, and sharing with us uh, all of your knowledge and your wisdom and your insights. It's been absolutely fascinating to have this discussion with you. Uh, for our viewers, please could you tell them how they can get hold of you or, or watch your materials? What's the best avenue for them to, uh, to, to watch your teaching? Yeah, sure. So um, we're on all the social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram. Uh, just look at, I've got one, Martin Isles, uh, and also the Australian Christian Lobby has one. Uh, look them all up, follow the ones you want to follow. But, uh, you know, the videos are all put out through that channel. Also, there's a podcast. You can search the truth of it uh, on Apple, Spotify, whatever you've got. Uh, and it'll come up there as well. So we're available in so many different ways. Um, and you can go to acl.org.au mm -hmm. uh, for Australia, and you can sign up to the email list as well and get our newsletters. So, uh, but start on social media, see the videos and, uh, and see how you like them, and uh, hopefully they're a blessing to you. They really are. I mean, I've, I've um, subscribed to your YouTube channel and uh, I highly recommend to any viewer watching today to, to subscribe also to follow you because um, your programs are very, very insightful, very interesting and very entertaining as well. So you're, you're a great speaker. And uh, once again, just thank you so much for coming on today. And um, may God bless you. May God bless the ACL. May God bless your ministry. And uh, I'm Paul Lyndon Burtwell and this has been Compelling Reason. God bless. <laughs>